say mama. I was trying to get him to say dada, and now here we are. He, he won't stop. <laughs> so, <we're, laughs> so this morning, actually, um, got a little bit of a surprise. I have a, some props to uh, start the day off this morning. Right here. So, I'm sure you all know what these are. These are two pieces of wood. But, can you guys tell me, well, you probably can't tell me from there. Let me just tell you what's different about these two pieces of wood. So, these, so wood, you know, a pe two pieces of wood like this, uh, from a distance, they would look pretty similar. Uh, if you're just seeing them, you know, obviously they're different dimensions. But, you know, if they were cut to the same dimensions, same specifications, uh, from a distance, you wouldn't be able to tell much about them. However, as uh, anybody who has worked with wood knows, you know, the kind of wood that you're working with has very different kind of characteristics based on what kind of, what kind of wood it is. Uh, some woods are very soft, some woods are very hard, and depending on what you are doing, what the application is, what the work is, you need different kinds of wood for that application. So here, um, here is just your basic cheap hardware store, probably like spruce, just regular wood that you're going to get if you're just looking for something cheap. This, actually, um, this wood is ash. You can see it's written right there, ash wood. This is ash wood. And what ash wood is good for is, well, it's actually quite a bit harder than your uh, hardware store wood. It's quite a bit more expensive. It's more dense. And what that makes it good for is for things like making axe handles like this. this. This axe handle is made out of a piece of ash wood very similar to this one. And the reason you want to make your axe handles out of something like ash wood or hickory wood is another good option for that, is because the axe itself has a very specific purpose. It has a specific use. You could, if you wanted to, you could make an axe handle out of the cheap hardware store wood. You could do it. You could cut this into these dimensions. You could put an axe head on it like that. And you could try to swing it into a piece of wood or a piece of, into a tree. But let me tell you what would happen. If you were to do that, you would get about two or three swings in and the handle would break because the cheap wood is not up to the task. It's not up to the quality. It can't perform that task. You need a specific kind of wood to fulfill specific kinds of tasks. You have to have special kinds of qualities in order to do the, those special kinds of uh, purposes, those special kinds of tasks. And uh, going back to the ax, you know, uh, so we've talked about the wood, but what about the steel? You know, can you take just any old cheap uh, piece of mild steel and form it into this shape and go uh, cut down trees? No, you can't do that. Uh, every quality axe that has been made in the last 200 years will actually have what's called, um, it'll be called high carbon steel. Uh, th this part of the bit, there's actually, um, you can't see it, but trust me, it's there. Uh, this part of the bit forward is a different kind of steel than this part of the bit backwards. From here forwards, it's harder. From here backwards, it's softer. There's actually two different hardnesses in this one axe head. Why? Well, obviously, you need it to be hard up here because this is where the impact is. If it wasn't hard, it would go dull quickly. So it needs to be very hard but it needs to be soft back here because from the impacts, if this was all hard, this would crack and break. So this needs to absorb, but this needs to stay sharp. There's two different purposes, two different qualities, two different specifications. I'll put these away. Now, how do we know everything I just told you? Everything I just told you, you know, uh, if you uh, spend any time in uh, 
uh, spend any time using tools, you will just pick up this kind of knowledge. And how do we know these things? Well, uh, we know these things because these things are tested. We, 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 through trial and error, we test the quality of materials for an application that we want to use them for. If we want to make a long stick and put something heavy at the end of it and beat things with it, we have to figure out what kind of wood works for that. If we want to uh, make something sharp and cut down trees, we have to figure out what kind, of, what kind of metal works best for that. Special qualities for special purposes. And those special qualities can only prove themselves through testing. You have to test something to know what it's capable of. You, have, you, you know, you can think of uh, any... Think of any bridge that you drive across. You know, any bridge that you drive on will have a load limit. You know, you can't just put infinite weight on any bridge. It has a load limit. And the engineers who designed the bridge will know what that load limit is. They will know what that bridge can safely handle. And the engineers who can know this because the materials, the steel and the concrete, that went into building that bridge have undergone testing, and the testing has proven whether or not those materials are up to the task of bearing the load. And in a very similar way, you know, God, God tests us. God tests his followers. He puts us through trials to see what we're made of, you know, to see what we can handle. Are we up to the task? To see if we are people of quality or not. In the book of James, in the New Testament, the author tells his audience to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So, he said, consider it joy when you experience trials. You know, God lets us experience hardships and trials because they can lead to us becoming more mature and complete. Now, that's where our joy comes from, is that it can make us more mature and complete. And why, why should we desire to become more mature and complete? Well, because every single one of us has a purpose and a calling on our lives. If we consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus, then that means that we are members of the kingdom of God. And in God's kingdom, everyone has something to do. Everyone has something that they can contribute you know, that's the thing about God is that he has, from the very beginning, made the intentional choice to involve us in his work. You know, think, think all the way back to the first humans, Adam and Eve. You know, did, did God need humanity? Did God need to make humanity? Could God have made creation in such a way that humanity was not necessary? And, you know, God could just rule over creation by himself without us. Of course he could. Of course he could have done that, but he didn't. He made humanity, and he gave us the special task of ruling and subduing creation. You know, that was our task. We have a special task to do, and because of that, we have a special status in God's creation. But as we know, uh, there is a right way and a wrong way to do the tasks that God gives us. The, and the right way to do it is to do it, you know, God's way. If God gives us a task, then the way to do it is to do it God's way, by God's design, using, you know, using God's wisdom. And the wrong way to do it is to do it, you know, our own way, by our own design, using our own wisdom, doing what seems good in our own eyes. That's when things go wrong, you know, when we try to go about doing things in whatever way seems best to us, and, and when we don't trust God's wisdom and his direction. And as we all know, you know, God calls people to do different kinds of tasks. You know, we, we all have different roles to fill. And from what we can see in the Bible, you know, some people are called to really special, sometimes like one-off uh, tasks. Uh, think of the 
the, the 12 apostles in the early church. The, the 12 apostles, you know, they, they led the first generation of Christians, and they had a unique role. You know, they, those 12 men had a unique status and authority in the church that will not be replicated. Their role and their experiences were unique to, to just them. Uh, they walked with Jesus, they were taught by Jesus, and Jesus commissioned them specifically to help start his church. And it only happened one time. That was their special role. And we see this in other places. You know, think of, think of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt and giving them the law. That was a, a role that was specific just to Moses. It's not going to happen again. No one else can duplicate it. And as we've already mentioned, you know, Adam and Eve and their role as the first human beings. And uh, what these examples have in common is that, you know, these people, Adam, Moses, uh, the 12 apostles, they lived at the key pivot points in history, at the times when God adjusts the course of humanity's history so that history can play out how he intends for it to play out. You know, that, that's, that's really how the history in the Bible reads. It, it, when you read your Bibles, you can pay attention to the passing of time in the story. If you pay attention to the passing of time in the story, you'll notice that there's actually a cycle that goes on, a cycle of, you know, things will happen over the course of a couple of generations, and then that kind of just gets set on the course and time passes. Generations and generations will, will pass. And then suddenly God will come in and just nudge things in a direction again. And in a couple of generations, lots of stuff will happen again. And then time passes and passes and passes. It's like the Bible, um, as, we, as you read through the Bible, I think I've give, given this demonstration before, it's like if we had a video camera, it focuses in for a couple of generations and then focuses back out and time passes. And it focuses in for a couple of generations and it focuses back out and time passes. So that's the cycle. Well, one of those focused pivot points in history revolves around the man named Abram, or better known as Abraham. Uh, we saw last week that, you know, God had really big plans for Abraham, didn't he? Uh, Abraham as well as Abraham's descendants. After all the sin and violence and failure that humanity had lived in, uh, basically since Adam and Eve and their son Cain murdered his brother Abel, you know, it was just a horrible cycle of violence, 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 destruction, destruction. But at, at the time of Abraham, God moved in history. God pivoted history in a way so as to create a people for himself from the descendants of Abraham, a special people for himself. And from these people, God intended to bless the rest of humanity. God intended for the descendants of Abraham to be the people through whom he showed the world what it means to live in the fear of the Lord, to do things God's way, by God's wisdom. The descendants of Abraham had a special calling on their lives. God intended for them to be the ones who would break humanity's cycle of violence and destruction and sin, which is no small thing to do. You know, up to this point in history, like when Abraham comes on the scene, up to this point in history, you know, humanity has really only known failure. Uh, humanity has really only known uh, corruption and sin. It's a horrible, like it's just, read Genesis 1 to 11. It's just uh, it's very um, bleak in its outlook on the human condition. But with the, com with the calling of Abraham and his family, you know, God called them to basically succeed where everyone else failed. God was calling Abraham to do something that up to that point no other family had done, and that is stick to the course of being faithful to God. That was his calling. That was their task, which is quite the task, you know. Let's not overlook just how difficult Abraham's calling was. He and his descendants were to be God's special people. They were supposed to be a unique family that were different from the rest of the world. That's a very difficult thing. And, we, and then we're prompted to ask the question, you know, is Abraham up to it? How can we know for certain that Abraham can do this? How can we know that he will succeed where everyone else has failed? Well, 
One way we can find out is to put Abraham through a test. A test to show whether or not Abraham is up to the challenge of being the man through whom God is going to raise up his own special people. And because the calling that Abraham had on his life was so extraordinary, the challenge that God puts to him, the test that God puts to him, will also be extraordinary. God is going to test Abraham by asking him to offer up his beloved son Isaac as a burnt offering. We can read about this in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 contains the final great test of Abraham. And it proves once and for all where Abraham's loyalties truly lie. Would you turn with me now, whether in your uh, scripture handout or in your Bibles, to Genesis chapter 22, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 19. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Some time later, God tested Abraham. So we need to pause. If you remember from last week, uh, last week we were looking at Genesis chapter 15, which is seven chapters before this. And there, last week, we, we saw God make a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant, covenant guaranteed that God would give Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan for their possession. And that was a great moment. Uh, God graciously took on the responsibility himself to see this covenant be fulfilled. Remember, God was the one who passed who passed through the animals. God took on the responsibility. God personally guaranteed that it would happen. But that covenant that God made with Abraham, you know, in, that we saw last week, that was about the land. And God said that it wasn't going to be fulfilled fully for another 400 years, you know, long after Abraham's death. Abraham was not going to see the full fulfillment of this promise. The promise applied to his descendants. But at that point, you know, in Genesis 15, Abraham didn't have any descendants. So right after that, you know, Abraham gets this promise. And then in Genesis 16, right after that, uh, Abraham and Sarah, they make a big mistake. They try to do things their own way. They get the idea to have Abraham marry Sarah's slave, Hagar, and have children through her. And Hagar, you know, it happens, and Hagar does indeed bear Abraham a son, However, this turns into just a huge family conflict, and the whole thing ends in a giant mess, and Hagar and her son Ishmael are sent away. And you know, there's another time, there's another story, where Abraham lets another man, a man named Abimelech, king of Gerar, uh, he lets him take Sarah as a wife. Abraham is just like, say you're my sister, and go to him and be his wife. This was actually the second time that something like this happened. No, twice, Abraham let another man take Sarah as a wife. And he did it so that he could save his own skin. He was worried that he would be killed. And these stories, you know, they, they cause tension because we see God making promises to Abraham and we see Abraham be faithful and then we see Abraham be unfaithful and then faithful and then unfaithful and then faithful and then unfaithful. And when we read them, our, our confidence in Abraham, you know, it kind of, it, it wavers, and we wonder, you know, which way is Abraham going to break? You know, he, he, he has these moments of great, he has these moments of great faith, and he also has these moments of great failure. So we, we read these stories and we wonder, you know, is this guy trustworthy? Does he have the quality? Can he hold up? Is he up to the challenge and calling that God has on his life? Because, you know, he seems to be a, mi a mixed bag of good and bad. And, you know, if you're doing something like building a bridge or building an axe handle, you can't have good and bad. It can only be good. If there's good and bad, the bad will cause failure. So which one is Abraham going to be? As I said earlier, this is a pivotal moment in history. Abraham and his family are at a critical part of God's plan. Can he do it? Can he be the man God wants him to be? Can he put his full trust in God to fulfill his promises? So by the time we get to where we are this morning in Genesis 22, uh, God has fulfilled his promise to give Abraham a son. 
Uh, between Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis chapter 22, Isaac is born. Abraham got his child, his descendant. But can he raise that child to, be, to carry on the family legacy? Can he raise that child to, uh, to carry on in the ways of the Lord? Or is he going to trust in his own wisdom? Is he going to do things his own way? Well, let's read on. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So here, at God's command, Abraham immediately acts. God doesn't explain why. God just makes, God, God just tells Abraham what he wants him to do, and Abraham obeys. This is, without a doubt, the hardest thing that God has ever asked Abraham to do, and he does it without hesitation. So we see the man of faith finally winning out. But we also get the hint of Abraham being a man of hope, along with the faith comes the hope. Notice what he says to his servants. We will worship and then we will come back to you. For a long time now, people have taken this as an indication that Abraham believed that somehow, some way, Isaac's life would be able to be carried on even if Abraham did what God asked him to do. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19, we read, By faith, Abraham when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So here, the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham reasoned that even if he did offer up Isaac, God could still raise Isaac from the dead and the promise would carry on. You know, this is a great testimony to the trust that Abraham now has in God's promises. Abraham now trusts what God said would happen. You know, before, Abraham had a lot of difficulty trusting in God's promises. He, he even laughed when God told him that Sarah would bear a child. Remember, God said, Sarah is going to bear you your son. And he laughs. I mean, do we have the courage to laugh in God's face? But Abraham did. So, right here, even when God has asked him to do the hardest thing he would ever have to do, Abraham finally shows his trust. Verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he, he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So again, the trust. Abraham doesn't know how God is going to provide, but he trusts that God will provide. God himself will provide. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So finally, Abraham has proven to be of sufficient quality. 
After years and years of successes and failures, Abraham proves that he fears God above all things. You know, up to this point, we see Abraham display a fear of really not having any descendants. That's what's, that seems to be what weighs on his mind the most, is that he doesn't have any descendants. He brings it up with God on multiple occasions. You haven't given me any descendants. And then he tries, and, and then he tries to create descendants by his own wisdom, by marrying Hagar. But here, finally, he shows that he fears God more than he fears dying without a child. And this issue, this thing that has so bugged him all of his life, this thorn in his flesh that has so dominated his life for so long, has now finally been put in submission to God and to the will of God. And Abraham passes the test. He is willing to give God the one thing that he had been hoping for his entire life. And he passes the test. Verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. He said, I, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your, your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And as we know, uh, that blessing that God just gave, it will culminate in Jesus. For the next 2,000 years or so, God will preserve Abraham's bloodline. It's a long story. We'll, go, th we'll uh, go through it by bits and pieces, but for the next 2,000 years, God will preserve Abraham's bloodline all the way until God's own son, Jesus, comes from Abraham's bloodline. And when Jesus does come on the scene, he too will be tested and tempted. Uh, Jesus uh, Jesus will be tested and tempted, the Bible says, in every way that we are. Except unlike Abraham and unlike us, Jesus will never fail. Jesus will pass every test, doing what even Abraham could not do. And also like Isaac, Jesus too will be bound and set to be killed. However, unlike Isaac... There will be no voice coming from heaven saying stop when Jesus is bound. There will be no ram caught in the thicket to act as a substitute for Jesus. He will face it all. As difficult as Abraham's calling was, Jesus' calling was infinitely more difficult because even Abraham didn't have to carry the weight of responsibility on his life that Jesus did. You know, as I've said before, all, all these people that we read about in the Bible, you know, as special, as, as special as their calling was and as important as their role in history was, every single one of them was ultimately replaceable. God could have found someone else to do their job. But not Jesus. Jesus was not replaceable. There was no one else who could do what Jesus had to do. No one else who could carry the weight of responsibility that Jesus carried. No one else in history has caused as much change as Jesus has caused. No one else has had a, as big of an impact on the world as Jesus has had. But a lot of that impact and a lot of that change has happened because, Jesus, because of what Jesus has done has happened through the faithful obedience of his followers. That's, that's us, you know. Ultimately, that's what God requires of those who follow Jesus is faithful obedience. You know, we're supposed to emulate him, and we're supposed to live by his example. Well, the example set before us in Abraham, and especially in Jesus, is the example of faithful obedience. Faithful obedience to do whatever it is that God has called us to do. And as we do what God has called us to do, we are contributing to the work that Jesus is doing. 
You know, that's the, that's the great thing about being a part of God's kingdom is that our efforts go towards accomplishing something that, you know, God wants to accomplish. If God wants to accomplish something, you know, don't you think God has the resources to get it done? You know, Ab- Abraham didn't have to work for the provision of the ram in the thicket. What Abraham did was Abraham acted out in faith and God provided the ram. Why should we expect anything different for ourselves? You know, if we are doing the Lord's work, why shouldn't we expect the Lord to provide what we need and when we need it? You know, we, we, the church, you know, we, we've gotten this far. God has preserved Uh, God has preserved his church now for going on 2,000 years since the resurrection. So why should we worry about God's ability to preserve us as we carry out the tasks that God has for us to do? why, Why should we not walk out in faith like Abraham did and just trust in God's promises? Remember, Remember the text explicitly says that Abraham believed and trusted God's promises. God made a promise to him. God made a promise to Abraham to give him a son, and through that son, he would have descendants. And then God asked Abraham to do something that seemed to completely go against that promise. And yet, Abraham still believed in the promise. What's our, what's our promise to us? What promises do we have? Well, One of the most significant uh, promises that we have as followers of Jesus uh, comes to us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. You know, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is giving his final words to his disciples. And he says, you know, uh, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have shown you. And behold, what? I am with you always. That's his promise to us. That's one of the most, I think, one of the most significant promises to us. One of the most significant promises to us that, you know, carries on forever in our lives that we can always count on. We can always count on the blood of Jesus covering our sins. We can always count on the cross breaking down that barrier between us and God. And we can always count on on Jesus being with us. He said, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that means, you know, through, through our trials and through our difficulties, you know, what can we do about them? You know, we just read about how God sends trials. God does test us. You know, in the, in the book of James, you know, James was written after Jesus. James was written uh, to the church. And in James, it says that God tests us. But does that mean that every single bad thing that happens to us is a test? You know, is that what it's getting at? Is that, does that mean that every, everything that is a trial, everything that's bad, is it, is it all from God? Is it all a test from God? Well, I don't think so. Uh, the, the Bible speaks of an enemy of our lives. Who go, the Bible says that the enemy of our lives goes around like a roaring lion looking for people to devour. There's an enemy who goes around spreading disease and destruction. There's an enemy who desires to make us miserable, who desires to lead us away from God. You know, how, many people, how many people go away from God because of the horrible things that they've experienced? Is that from God, or is that from the enemy who wants to destroy them? How can we know which one we are experiencing? How can we know what we're living in? How did Abraham Abraham know whether it was God speaking to him or not? Well, I think a good place to start is to really know God. And Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. If we know the voice of the shepherd, you know, I think this is, this is attested all throughout Christian history. You know, the sheep who know the voice of the shepherd know if the shepherd is leading them into a difficult time. And they also know if it's not the shepherd who is speaking to them. Closeness to God. Knowing the voice of God. 
knowing when it is him who is calling us into a trial, and knowing when it is him who is comforting us when we are in oppression from the enemy. Both of those things can happen. You know, it's not a, it's not a one-dimensional reality, reality that we live in. When we are close to God, when we know the voice of Jesus, that's what makes us capable of handling whatever it is that life throws at us, whether that's a test from God or whether that's destruction from the enemy. The cure for both of those things is closeness, intimacy with the Father, with the Son, knowing what he's done for us, knowing his love for us. You know how much pain and confusion in the world could be cured by people simply knowing the true heart of the Father. How many lies are spread on social media, the internet, throughout the world about what people think is God, when re- who really, those things do not represent God at all. They're spreading lies about God. They're making God out to be one who does the work of the enemy, one who, does, one who is an enemy to our souls. No, that's not God. That's not God. God is a loving Father. God is a loving Father who, yes, at times, will discipline his children. But, you know, anybody who's been a parent knows that, you know, is it sometimes loving to discipline our children? We understand this. We understand when it's loving to be disciplined. We understand when it's loving to ask our children to do difficult things. It helps them grow. And that's exactly how the Bible speaks about God. But we know whether it's God speaking to us. We know if it's God asking to us if we have that closeness to him. And if we have that closeness to him, then we will grow in our quality, in our endurance. We will become more useful. We can, you know, that's the thing about human beings. You know, how human beings, we are not like a a piece of wood. You know, a piece of wood just is what it is. If it's low quality, it's low quality. There's no changing it. But people, us, we have the Holy Spirit. We can go from low quality to high quality. We can continue to grow. We can continue to change and develop and be even more useful going forward. So whatever it is that we are facing, whatever it is where we are at, remember, God can meet us where we are at. God can speak to us where we are at. God can help us where we are at. And God can also challenge us to grow beyond where we are at. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for demanding the best from us. And whatever it is that each one of us can give, Lord, you want us to do it to the best that we have, and you want us to grow, you want us to be wise, and we ought to feel joy that we get to do this, that we get to grow in this way. Lord, we thank you for the faithful people who have gone before us, who are an example to us of what it means to be faithful. Lord, help us to have a faith like that. Especially, Lord, the faith and the trust of your Son who went to his death. He went to his death knowing what was on the other side, trusting what was on the other side. Lord, what is it that each one of us can do? How can we grow? How can we become more mature, more wise, more understanding? Lord, these tests that you bring to our lives, ultimately they are for the purpose of bringing about good for us and good for others. It's a desirable thing to pursue. Help us to grow. Help us to keep moving forward. Help us to know what to do. Lord, I pray that we leave here once again transformed, become more like you. Amen.